Sodium carbonate reacts with hydrochloric acid in an exothermic reaction. That means the temperature will increase during this reaction. The equation for the reaction is Na2CO3 in the solid state, so that will be the sodium carbonate, reacts with the HCl aqueous, two moles, and that's a solution. And then it turns into 2NaCl aq, also a solution, carbon dioxide gas and liquid water. A student investigated the effect of changing the mass of sodium carbonate powder, so again we're being told it's a solid, on the highest temperature reached by the reaction mixture. Plan a method to investigate the effect of changing the mass of sodium carbonate powder on the highest temperature reached. Questions like this will always have a banded mark scheme, and so we want to aim for a level 3 answer, which means that we'll be aiming for 5 or 6 marks out of 6. And to get those marks, we need to make sure we're clear about what the question is asking us to do and the experiment it's asking us to plan a method for before structuring our answer. The starting point for this is to unpick key information. We're being told it's an exothermic reaction, so the temperature will increase, and so we're likely to be doing an experiment that measures that temperature increase. And so your brain needs to be thinking, I've done experiments like this using a chemical reaction inside a polystyrene cup, and we have a thermometer to measure that temperature change. We've also been told that we're investigating the effect of changing the mass of sodium carbonate powder. Well, whenever they say that we're changing something, this is the independent variable. And it's the effect on the highest temperature reached. And that will be the dependent variable. And there's obviously a third type of variable, which are control variables. And these are things that we need to keep the same. Mark schemes are quite hard to unpick for questions like this. It's not always obvious how we get the five or six marks. There are often bits in bold which are identified as key steps, and these must be included in the topped band answer. And that's because the investigation wouldn't work without them. And you can usually score these marks in a brief method, including the essential equipment that you would use. You also need to make sure your experiment would give a valid outcome. So that means that you need to describe or acknowledge the fact that you're kind of being mindful of the key variables in this experiment. So you're describing what you'll change and what you'll measure and what you'll keep the same. So that's those control variables. And you should aim to include two control variables as a minimum in your method. Your answer also needs to be logically sequenced. And this doesn't mean that you should write in continuous paragraphs of extended text. You can write in bullet points. In fact, I encourage you to write in bullet points because that makes it easier for the examiner to find out which marks you should be awarded. And so the method that you write needs to tell the story of the steps that you would carry out as you worked your way through this investigation. And so the first thing that you would do is measure the volume of hydrochloric acid that you're going to use with a measuring cylinder to make sure you get the accurate volume. And then you would pour this acid into the polystyrene cup where the chemical reaction was going to take place. And then you would add a known mass of sodium carbonate to the polystyrene cup. And you would have measured this known mass with a balance and that allows you to know that you're using a particular mass of the sodium carbonate. When referring to the fact that we are measuring particular quantities of solid, we should always say that we are measuring the mass, and if we are measuring a liquid, we should always say that we are measuring the volume of that liquid. And then once you've added your sodium carbonate to the acid, you would need to stir this mixture. And you could achieve that by stirring it with the thermometer that you will use to measure the temperature. And then that would be the next step of this method. You would measure the highest temperature reached with that thermometer that you'd already put in and were using to stir. Now you could also measure the starting temperature and the finishing temperature in an investigation like this, but you've been commanded to find out the effect of changing the mass on sodium carbonate on the highest temperature reached, not the temperature change. 
And since we need to know the effect of changing that mass of sodium carbonate, the next thing that we would do is repeat the experiment and this time we would use a different mass of sodium carbonate. And then again, we would measure that highest temperature reached with this new mass of sodium carbonate. And realistically, to be confident that you've achieved a valid outcome, you would aim to do five different masses of sodium carbonate in total. And then, once you've done this experiment once through with your five different masses of sodium carbonate, you would repeat the whole investigation again. This would allow you to spot any results that were anomalies. That means that they didn't fit in with the general pattern. And then you could calculate a mean for the highest temperature reached. And then the final step is to acknowledge the control variables. And so these are the variables that you would need to keep the same each time you repeated the experiment, whether that was for the same mass as previously or for a new mass of sodium carbonate. And there are a number of control variables that you should use. The most important three are, firstly, the starting temperature of the acid. If you are measuring the highest temperature reached, it's really important to start at the same temperature every time because that will definitely have an effect on the highest temperature reached. Second, we need to make sure we use the same volume of acid each time we do this experiment because a different volume of acid, a higher volume for instance, would make a different temperature change occur, probably a higher temperature for a higher volume of acid. And then finally, we need to make sure that we use the same concentration of acid each time we repeat the experiment because a more concentrated solution of acid is likely to give us a higher temperature change. And so this is more than enough to get us our six marks. The five key steps are highlighted here. These are non-negotiable. They must be included to get six marks out of six. In addition to that, you should include at least two of the control variables, which are the final three bullet points. And it's possible that you would need to use one or two of these extra points as well that I'm showing slightly offset from the others. These are linked ideas rather than absolutely key concepts. And so have in mind that when looking at a mark scheme, you need to include all of the ideas in bold and two or three of the others, including for a question like this, the control variables. Figure one shows a line of best fit drawn through the student's results. And you can see on the x-axis, there is the thing that has been changed, and that is the mass of sodium carbonate in grams. And on the y-axis, we have the highest temperature reached by the reaction mixture in degrees C. We have been commanded to determine the gradient of the line of best fit in the figure one, and we've been commanded to use the equation where the gradient is the change in highest temperature divided by the change in mass, and we have a follow-up command to give the unit. And we've got five marks available for this question. When you've got a graph question and you've been commanded to use the particular graph, I would encourage you to get into the habit of annotating that graph and showing the examiner how you've extracted the data from it that you're going to use. Because if you extract the wrong data from the graph, you can still get some credit. And so we're going to be using the equation change in highest temperature divided by change in mass. And so the first things that we need to do are to find the change in the highest temperature and the change in the mass. In order to do this, we need to use the y-axis, and the y-axis goes up in 0.2s for each small square. I know this because the bottom is 20, and we go 10 little squares up, and that is 22. So that is a change of 2 degrees C, but we've had 10 squares to achieve that change. So each square is 0.2. And then for one gram of sodium carbonate powder, if we read up to the best fit line and then we read across to the y-axis, we can see we're at 22 and then one small square. And so that means we're at 22.2. And then for the maximum for five grams, we find five grams, we read up to the line and then we read across and we get 28 
plus three little squares, so that is 28.6. And so our temperature change is 28.6 minus 22.2, which gives us 6.4 degrees C as our change in highest temperature. This gets us our first mark. The change in mass is much easier. The First of all, we had one gram, and then we had five grams for the values that I'm using here. And so the change is five minus one, which is four grams. That is our second mark. And so to calculate the gradient, we need to take that change in highest temperature, 6.4 degrees C, and divide that by our change in mass, which is 4 grams. And this gets us our third mark for setting out the calculation. It's always important to show your calculations that you're using for any question worth more than two marks. And then for our answer, we get 1.6 for our value. That gets us the fourth marking point. And then we've been commanded to give the unit. Now, sometimes the units are things that you just need to remember. But when you're using a graph, you need to think about how you got the value for your gradient. Well, the highest temperature was in degrees C. And we divided that highest temperature by the mass, which was in grams. So we've taken a, an amount in degrees C and divided it by grams. And so the units are going to be degrees C per gram. But when you write units, you can't leave it like this. It needs to be a single line fraction. And so degrees C per gram needs to have the grams brought up to the same line as the degrees C. And this horizontal line needs to become a forward slash. And so the units for this gradient are degrees C per gram. And you'd write it like this. And this would get you your fifth mark out of five. The initial temperature for the reaction is where the line of best fit would meet the y-axis. Determine the initial temperature of the reaction mixture. Show your working on figure one. There are actually two different ways that we can answer this question. The first one that I prefer is to take the line of best fit that you've been given and then continue it until you reach the y-axis. This process is called extrapolating. And to do this, you would simply put your ruler and line it up with the best fit line and then draw an additional line from where the best fit line ends to where the best fit line would meet the y-axis. And when I do this, I get just over three little squares above the origin. And so that means that since each little square is worth 0 0.2, I've got a value of 20.6 degrees C for my extrapolation. So I get one mark for the extrapolated line, continuing that best fit line along, and one mark for my actual value of 20.6. And if you made an error with your extrapolation, but then read off the y-axis value correctly, you would get one mark of the two. The second way to answer this question is to use the gradient that you worked out in the previous question. We got an answer of 1.6 degrees C per gram of sodium carbonate. And this means that for every gram of sodium carbonate that you add, the temperature reached will be higher by 1.6 degrees C. And that works in reverse as well. And so for a one gram sample of sodium carbonate, the highest temperature reached was 22.2. .2. And so if we subtract 1.6 from that value, we will get the temperature when we use zero grams of sodium carbonate. So that means the initial temperature. And so we get an answer of 20.6 this way as well. They have said show you're working on figure one. And so to do that, you would need to read off the 22.2 value and then subtract 1.6 from it and that would get you the first marking point and the second marking point would be the initial temperature. Another student repeated the investigation but added sodium carbonate until the sodium carbonate was in excess. And this is different because the first student added a particular mass of sodium carbonate, measured that highest temperature, and then repeated the whole thing by starting again and adding an entirely different mass of sodium carbonate to an equivalent volume of acid, but fresh acid. 
This person has taken a particular volume of acid and added more and more and more sodium carbonate to that exact same acid, measuring the highest temperature each time they add a bit more of the sodium carbonate, and then they've kept going until they've got an excess of sodium carbonate. That excess means that all the acid has gone, and we're just adding more sodium carbonate to the reacted mixture, fully reacted mixture. And so we've got three options here, and we've been asked to pick which sketch graph shows the results obtained when sodium carbonate was added until excess. Option A has a linear relationship and then the linear relationship continues at a steeper gradient. Option B has a continuous linear relationship throughout, same gradient as the original, give or take. And then the third option is, again, that same linear relationship, but then we reach a point when that relationship completely flattens and the highest temperature reached is constant. And C is actually the correct answer, because what we would expect is the increase in temperature as we add more sodium carbonate, exactly how we found for our reaction for the first student, but once we reach an excess of sodium carbonate, it doesn't matter how much more we add, we will not reach a higher temperature because there is no acid left for that sodium carbonate to react with. And that's why that temperature doesn't change after this point. This point here, whatever that number might be, that is the point where we are adding an excess of sodium carbonate. Figure two shows a reaction profile for the reaction of sodium carbonate with hydrochloric acid. And we can see we've got a typical reaction profile here, but they have missed some things out. They've not labeled the y-axis value. They're calling that x. We've got the starting energy of the reactants here, whatever that number might be. They don't ever show numbers on profiles like this, really. And then we've got a curve that goes up to a peak and then down again, and it goes down to the products. And this product's value, as we read across this dashed line, this is the energy that the products have got. And then we've got a line from the reactant's energy to the product's energy, and that's not labelled either. They've just called this Y. And the question is asking us, what do the labels X and Y represent on figure two? Well, the x-axis is the progress of the reaction. So that is time, really, where here is the beginning of the reaction and here is the end of reaction. So as time goes on, the reaction progresses. And what X is doing is it's showing us how much energy the chemicals have got at different stages in the reaction. Here we've got the reactant's energy, here we've got the product's energy, here we've got the energy increasing as we put the activation energy to make the reaction happen. And so X is simply the energy. That's all you would need to write for that one mark. Y is obviously related to that energy. It is going from the reactant's energy level, that is here, and pointing down to the product energy level, and that's here. And so Y is representing the energy change for those chemicals. And then the final part of this question says, how does the reaction profile show that the reaction is exothermic? Use figure two. The fact that we're being commanded to use the reaction profile means that we need to answer in terms of energy of the reactants and products and not comment on bonds breaking, which sometimes is a viable answer, but not when we're referring to a reaction profile. So there's two ways that we could answer that. We could first of all say that the energy level of the products is below that of the reactants, and that allows us to tell at a glance that this is exothermic. For endothermic, the products would be higher than the reactants. Alternatively, we could say that the energy of the chemicals is decreasing, and that is distinctive of an exothermic reaction. The chemical energy decreases and the thermal energy is released as a result of that. And so the temperature would increase, whereas in endothermic, the chemical energy increases and thermal energy therefore goes down and the temperature would drop.